Hello and welcome back to Oncology for Medical Students and this section of video is on molecular basis of cancer. This video is on tumour suppressor genes. In the previous videos we've learned that cancers arise as a result of a number of mutations to genes and that the mutated genes that are responsible for the changes that lead to cancer are involved in a number of processes that are outlined in the hallmarks of cancer. If you've not seen these, I'd strongly recommend that you have a look at the previous videos in the series. Depending on how the genes affect the cancer-promoting process they're involved in, they can be divided into two categories, tumour suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes. Broadly speaking, tumour suppressor genes inhibit the growth and division of cells, and proto-oncogenes promote the growth and division of cells. The mutated forms of proto-oncogenes are known as oncogenes. These genes have important functions in the normal human development and function, but when they malfunction as a result of mutations, they can promote the growth of cancers. Tumor suppressor genes are considered to be genes which code for proteins whose function is to prevent the formation of tumors, or to act as the brakes on the cell cycle. If the genes mutate in such a way that they produce proteins that cannot perform these functions, they can contribute to the development of cancer. Because the proteins are losing their normal function, these mutations are called loss of function mutations. As you may already know, we inherit two copies of every gene, one from our father and one from our mother. As long as we have one functional copy of these tumour suppressor genes that are able to produce enough of the tumour suppressor protein, that gene can suppress the formation of tumours. For tumour suppressor genes to be inactivated, therefore, both copies need to be taken out with mutations. This means that tumour suppressor genes are, in essence, recessive genes. Often people talk about tumour suppressor genes being like that, uh, the brakes of a car. They halt the car and stop it from moving on. If the brakes get damaged, however, the car can't stop, as we'll see in our next example. The best example for showing how tumour suppressor genes are involved in the formation of cancers is the retinoblastoma gene. Retinoblastoma is a cancerous tumour of the retina, the layer of cells at the back of the eye responsible for detecting light. One of the tumour suppressor genes involved in its development has been named after it, the retinoblastoma gene. To understand what's going on, we need to have a look at what's going on inside the cell at the G1 checkpoint. When a cell reaches the G1 checkpoint to pass into S phase, where DNA replication occurs, it needs to build the proteins, or enzymes, that are needed to carry out DNA replication. An important part of this process involves a protein called a transcription factor. Transcription factors are proteins that bind to sequences of DNA and encourage the transcription of particular genes, which are then turned into proteins. At the G1 checkpoint, the most important transcription factor needed to start the building of uh, the proteins for DNA replication is E2F. In cells, E2F is normally bound to another protein called retinoblastoma, or RB. The function of the retinoblastoma protein is to inactivate the E2F protein and stop the cell's DNA from replicating. Hopefully you're now seeing why the retinoblastoma or RB protein is considered to be a tumor suppressor. It's stopping the cell from going past the G1 checkpoint. For a cell to divide therefore, RB needs to be inactivated. This is achieved through a process called phosphorylation, whereby a chemical group called a phosphate group is added to the protein to inactivate it. This allows E2F to go ahead with its job of allowing the cell to move into S phase. By controlling the phosphorylation of RB 
the RB protein. The rate at which cells enter S phase and later divide can be controlled. If the retinoblastoma gene mutates, however, and starts producing a protein which cannot bind to E2F, it doesn't matter whether it's phosphorylated or not, it won't be able to function anyway, and the E2F transcription factor will be allowed to move the cell into S phase. So it turns out that if you have one functional copy of the retinoblastoma gene, you can produce enough of the RB protein to control the activity of E2F. This brings us to another important theory, the two-hit hypothesis. To put it simply, for the RB gene to be rendered inactive, and any other tumor suppressor gene for that matter, both copies need to be mutated. The consequences of this are evident in real life. Retinoblastoma, gene, uh, retinoblastoma tumors appear in two different sets of people, those which run in families, inherited retinoblastomas, and those that appear in people randomly, spontaneous retinoblastomas. When it occurs in families, it's inherited in this following fashion. One of the parents carries a mutated, non-functioning RB gene. They pass this on to 50% of their children. What this means is that every single cell in the affected children's body will be carrying one faulty copy of the RB gene from the moment of conception. The children won't start developing tumours until the other normal copy has mutated in any cell of the body. But even from conception, these children already have the first mutation or the first hit. They then only require one further mutation, the second hit, in order for the other copy of the gene in any cell to lead to the inactivation of RB. In, spontane in spontaneous tumours, the person has two normal copies in every single cell of their body to start with. They need to gain two spontaneous mutations, one in each copy of the gene. In a single cell, the chances of which are far lower, meaning that it usually requires more time for this to occur. And this is what you see in real life. People with inherited mutations get tumours at a much younger age and may develop more than one tumour. Those with spontaneous tumours on average develop them later in life and almost never have more than one tumour. This two-hit hypothesis applies to the majority of tumour suppressor genes. Interestingly, retinoblastoma gene is mutated in many cancers, which makes sense as it is an important regulator of the cell cycle. When people inherit a mutated copy, every cell in the body, not just retinal cells, are affected and are at risk of developing into tumours. The reason why the gene was named after the retinoblastoma, uh, retinoblastoma um, is that these inherited forms, um, in these inherited forms, the first tumours that develop are retinoblastomas. Given more time, they would develop other kinds of tumours. No talk on tumour suppressor genes would be complete without the mentioning of the king of tumour suppressors, P53. Around 50% of all cancers have a mutation in their P53 gene. P53 stops tumours from developing by two key mechanisms. In response to DNA damage or stress, it activates a, a gene which then halts the cell cycle. The other method it utilises is the activation of apoptosis in damaged cells. Clearly, if P53 stopped functioning, the consequences for a cell would be disastrous. Mutations would be passed on and cells would divide without control. While most cancers acquire P53 mutations at some point via spontaneous mutations, in rare cases, people can inherit damaged P53 genes. Those that do inherit these develop something called lee fraumeni syndrome, whereby something like 50% of people end up developing a cancer by the age of 30. In conclusion, genes involved in the development of cancers fall into two groups, tumour suppressor genes and oncogenes. 
Tumor suppressor genes act as the brakes on the cell cycle and stop damaged cells from dividing. The development of cancers requires two hits, mutations in both copies of the tumor suppressor genes. The RB and P53 genes are the most well-described examples of tumor suppressors, but of course there are many, many more. Thanks for watching the video. Uh, the next part will be on oncogenes. Thank you.